Hey everybody, it's Derek Hall Martin from CodeOpinion.com. If you're starting a new greenfield project, how much effort do you put into the overall architecture and design? What are the things that you should be thinking of and considering? This is also really applicable if you have an existing system that you're trying to decompose or maybe rewrite portions of. I'm going to explain some critical things that I think you need to decide or be aware of at the very beginning when you're laying that foundation of the design and the architecture of your system. It will allow you to evolve your system over time. This video is brought to you by EventStoreDB, the stream database built from the ground up for event sourcing, CQRS, and event-driven microservices. For more on EventStoreDB, check out the link in the description. So the idea for this video actually came from a question from Alex on my private Discord server available to members. If you're interested in joining, check out the links in the description. And his question revolved around this and saying, would you start with event sourcing or maybe CRUD? Given it's a monolith, how much effort would you put into the structure, decoupling, vertical slice architecture, or maybe clean architecture from the very beginning? Now, this is a huge topic. There's obviously going to be requirements that you have that are going to guide you and force you down a certain path potentially. For example, there may be compliance or regulatory requirements that you have that kind of force you in a certain direction or scaling or performance implications. Again, I get it. Requirements are going to force you in a certain direction. However, these are the things that I'm really thinking about kind of beyond those. So first, let's talk about size, because I'm not referring to applications that if you had to rewrite them could take weeks or months. Really, I'm talking about systems, large systems that take years to develop and are going to be used for years and evolve over the course of those years. And anyone that's worked in a large system, you know how difficult it can be if over time things are left unchecked and it becomes a highly coupled mess where it's really hard to make changes. It's really easy to introduce bugs because there's so much coupling. It just, it really does turn into a really big turd pile where all you really want to do is kind of rewrite stuff because it's such a mess. Nobody really wants to be in the situation. That's why the question is like, how much effort do you put into that initial architecture design so you don't get into this mess in the future? So what does your system actually do? No, really. Like, what's the core of it? What's the heart of it? When you think of a system, yeah, it has all these different capabilities, can do all these different things, but all those things aren't created equal in terms of value. Your system generally probably has some focus, something that it's really trying to solve and do really well, but it does need other capabilities with it to support it. So it's not that there's just one system, is that you have a system that's composed of many different things and there's gonna be a heart to that. And there's gonna be boundaries or other parts of your system that while they're still valuable, they're really not at the center. They're really not the focal point, but they need to be there to support that heart of really what you're doing. So understand first and foremost, what that heart, what that really the core is of what you're building and what those supporting parts that are required. So what I'm talking about is defining logical boundaries. In my opinion, defining boundaries is easily one of the most important things to do early on, but it's very difficult to get right. I say right, meaning it's a difficult thing to do to get it exactly the way you want it, because that's going to change. It's going to evolve as potentially requirements change, your understanding, and you're having aha moments, or you'll realize that kind of how you model things could be done a different way. But still, defining boundaries at the very beginning is one of the most important things to do. One of the reasons it's difficult to define logical boundaries is because things sound the same. You may be in the domain and talking to people within the domain and they use the exact same terms, but the difference is they don't mean it the same way. Their intent is different on really when they're saying those terms, they mean different things. And I love this from Mel Conway. He posted this a few years ago, which is when a politician greets you with, how are you? And a nurse greets you with, how are you? They're totally different questions, even though they sound the same and are spelled the same. And this happens even within a single domain. Now, my concrete example to something like this is if you were working in an e-commerce distribution warehouse type system and somebody says the product price, well, what do you think that means? Well, it depends on who you're talking to. If you're talking to somebody in sales because they're customer centric, they're talking about the sale price, what you're actually selling it to customers. If you're talking to somebody in purchasing, when they say the price, they're talking about the cost the vendor price, what we actually have to pay to get the item because they're vendor centric. So when you just say product price, 
that sounds the same to two different people, but it means two different things. So focus on cohesion, grouping capabilities, functionality together. That's actually related together. So instead of having that turd pile that's highly coupled and has no cohesion, organizing within logical boundaries, grouping these things together. When I mentioned kind of the idea of that product is that product doesn't need to live in a singular place. The concept of a product exists within different logical boundaries. Like I was mentioning, there's capabilities related to selling product and the sale price that would exist within sales. Purchasing has a whole different set of capabilities related to vendors and purchasing and having the price slash cost. They're the same idea of a product, but they actually have different um, concepts and capabilities and data within different logical boundaries. So think about cohesion, think about logical boundaries. One major advantage of defining logical boundaries is as I mentioned earlier, they're not actually all created equal. Some are more kind of core at the heart of what you're doing and some are more in a supporting role. So that means that you can define the implementation details for each uh, individual logical boundary independently. For example, maybe it's persistence. Maybe in persistence in one logical boundary that's more in a supporting role, maybe you just wanna be using a relational database because that best fits that use case. Maybe at the core, it's more something where you wanna do event sourcing and you have an event store. So you use that in that particular use case. You get to decide per logical boundary what you're doing. Because you're doing event sourcing, you're likely more using a task-driven approach. And more of those supporting boundaries, maybe it's more CRUD. Again, you get to decide and make a lot more, you have more options, more decisions that you can make. Instead of the overarching entire system, you can decide this per logical boundary. Another foundational aspect is using an event or message-driven architecture to loosely couple between logical boundaries. The problem with our turd pile is we were tightly coupled. We had all these different logical boundaries or pieces of functionality that just related and were coupled to everything else. But rather we can asynchronously be telling other boundaries something has occurred and they can do with it whatever they need to. So when we have one logical boundary, something's occurred, we can publish an event, and then asynchronously we could have other logical boundaries be consumers and they can consume those events. Why does a messaging or event-driven architecture, why is that so foundational? Because it allows you to extend your system. Not just communicate between boundaries, but extend your system. As an example, let's say we're talking about a food delivery app and system that you have. There's various things that need to happen. One piece of functionality, for example, is that you wanna send a push notification to the mobile app when the driver is nearing your house to deliver the food. How exactly would you do that? Well, because the driver has the app on the phone and they're traveling down the road in their car, if it's sending position updates back to your system via an event, you could be controlling that event with one consumer, even if it's within its own logical boundary. And that consumer could be consuming that event and sending out the push notification. Now let's say we have a new requirement where we also wanna send a text message guess what we're gonna have? Just a separate consumer for that same event. We don't have to mix code between also sending that text message, that push notification and our text message. These are separate consumers. Whether they live in the same logical boundary is entirely fine, but allows us to extend functionality without having to change existing fun functionality. Now developers love talking about scaling, the scale that they need, performance, the requests that they need to process, etc. And yes, that can drive your requirements, obviously. But one thing I wanna point out when I'm talking about logical boundaries is logical boundaries aren't physical boundaries. So they do not need to be physical boundaries. So this is a four plus one architectural view model. And the idea here that I really wanna focus on here is the logical view, it being different than the physical view. And what do I mean by that? So let's say we have a system here where we have some CRM as one logical boundary. Let's say that's more in a supporting role. We have some finance, which is in a supporting role. And let's say we were talking about food delivery. We have ordering and our delivery, different boundaries. That's really more of the heart of it. And like I said, they're using different things. Our ordering is using a relational database and maybe our delivery um, boundary is using an event store. Now, when I'm talking about logical boundaries, this is a logical boundary. CRM is maybe integrating with Salesforce. And our ordering is a logical boundary with its database. 
and including its front end, the same thing with delivery and the same thing with finance, maybe integrating into QuickBooks or some accounting system. Now, the thing is here is that these are logical boundaries. A physical boundary, if we were talking about a monolith, would be this, how we're actually deploying it. This could be a single process. Now, why I mentioned this related to performance or scaling is that because we've defined logical boundaries, because they're loosely coupled between each other, now you can see that it is a separate concern. If delivery, for example, needed to be scaled differently, that's we could change our physical aspect and have CRM, finance, and ordering be one physical boundary and it deployed as one unit and delivery could be deployed as a separate unit. So don't confuse logical and physical boundaries. So how much effort should you put into so how much effort should you put into defining your architecture and design in a greenfield project? Or if you want to decompose an existing system or rewrite portions of it, well, you need to understand the domain. So that's the amount of effort that you need to put in because you need to be able to define logical boundaries. Once you have logical boundaries, then you can define the implementation details that obviously are going to be driven by different functional and non-functional requirements. But you can decide per logical boundary the implementation details of maybe you're using a clean architecture in one or a vertical slice architecture in one. Maybe that you choose how you want to persist is different in one boundary than another. You get to make these decisions. How you then communicate and extend your system with a message or event driven architecture is really key to being able to evolve and extend your system over time. If you found this video helpful, please give it a thumbs up. And if you want to chat with other software developers about software architecture and design and topics like this, make sure to join my channel where you can get access to a private Discord server. Check out the links in the description on how to join. If you have any other thoughts or questions, make sure to leave a comment and please subscribe for more videos on software architecture and design. Thanks.